Empire. Hello and welcome to my podcast. Do me a favor, subscribe to the John Carmen Report wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching on YouTube. Hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. You can find us there as part of Empire Media. That's A M P I R E. Always much appreciated when you tune in. And today, well, I had a different podcast plan, but things have changed, as I'm sure you know. So I had Matthew Paris from the Washington Times, Sam Forday from the Washington Post, and Pete Haley from NBC Sports Washington on Thursday morning. We taped a show talking a little bit about ownership, kind of how we saw things going, and it's the way it's happened. Also then talking about, you know, the draft, the roster, this thing, that thing, but more on the field stuff. I'm going to play that when we're through with this ownership situation. And so that'll probably be next week. But today I wanted to give you the latest on the Josh Harris bid. And I think you know a lot right already, but I wanted to give you more details and things to that you need to know moving forward. So let's start with the bottom line. The bottom line is that the Josh Harris's bid of $6.05 billion is right is right now it was the deal that was agreed upon. However, they are entered into a they are not in an exclusive phase in terms of negotiation. So it's it's a non-exclusive situation, which means that somebody else conceivably could still enter the bidding if they came in, let's say tomorrow, Steve Apostolopoulos comes in with seven billion dollars. Well, there you go. Because it's non-exclusive, they can still do that. However, the deal has been agreed upon. It's just not finalized. You, I have to, I have to emphasize that because it means that there's still, you know, it still has to get be finalized, still has to be sent to the league for approval. That hasn't happened yet either as I talk. So that's what you need to know there. Let's get to some more stuff as far as what you need to go. This is the first time we've reached this point. I know there was a lot of hullabaloo about it being done or whatever a month ago and talking to multiple people at the time, that was not the case. And then talking to someone else who was involved in the Harris group pretty high up said that was never the case, but we're at that point now. And I think that's why you folks can take a big, deep breath and uh, of, you know, an exhale. <laughs> I, I think like this has always been how it was going to go. He was always going to sell the team. There was not a threat of him keeping the team based on anybody I talked to. And I think I told you that all along, but I understand the trepidation and we are at this point. So I think, you know, We've heard all this stuff before, um, but it was not close until we hit this point. Now, I will say a couple of weeks ago, I had heard that it was a couple of weeks away. So, but throughout this process, we've heard, and then you guys have heard soon, 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 so many times, what the hell does soon mean? You know, so you want a more specific timetable. Now, a couple of weeks, it has fallen within that time frame as far as when We've hit this point. Again, still has to be finalized, still has to be sent to the league for approval, but they have agreed on 6.05 fully funded offer by the Josh Harris group. So, um, you know, I think that's that's obviously it's a quite a big step. Um, all right, so let's let's get you more as to what now needs to happen. First of all, after it's approved, after it's sent to the league for approval. Then the NFL Finance Committee starts digging into the finances and the specifics of the offer. They have to look at everybody involved in this. That means all the limited partners. As a, I'm going to back, I'm going to stop for a minute to let you know, Denver, for example, in that situation, it was June 7th when they agreed to a deal with the Walton family to buy the Broncos. It took until July, I think it was June 7th or night, but it took until. July 27th before they fully vetted the situation. And then from there, I think like a couple weeks later, the owners voted on it. So when I, because I had put out a tweet earlier today, just saying that, hey, you know, if all goes well, like they're going to vote at it at the league meeting in May, which is the 22nd to the 24th. And at that point, the deal's done. It's over. Someone from the league cautioned me and just said, keep in mind, the Denver, the Denver deal went like this. And that was just one family. It was the Walton family who has billions upon billions, and it still took them that long to get it done. So just have some patience with this situation because they have to vet all the people involved in the process. So any limited partner must be fully, 
fully vetted by the finance committee before they then send their you know their assessment to the the other owners for a vote that means like now what we know is Josh Harris was a minority partner with the Steelers so that he's good to go he went through the process in Denver last year Mitchell Rails will have to be fully vetted Magic Johnson there's also I do believe there's probably there are probably other limited partners that we don't know about and each one of those people will have to be vetted. So I don't think it's just Harris and Magic and Mitchell Reyes. I do think that there are some other people involved in this, which is why it could take, you know, at least till that point to get it where they feel comfortable voting on it. So don't be shocked if the vote takes place after the late May meetings. I think you're I think it's probably at a good point to get there. Because we're right now, we're still talking about what six weeks away or so. So that's probably in good shape. So if they can get this sent to the league next week, that would start the process. Now I know there are a lot of fans like, don't they want them out? Why don't they just do it now? Well, you can't. You're not going to just vote on a six billion dollar deal just like that because because the fans hate Dan Snyder. They don't like Dan Snyder. We know that. They're also businessmen. They're not Commanders fans. They don't care if he's out on April fifteenth or if it's June 15th. The bottom line is when the season begins, he will be out. That's what matters to them. They don't, they're, again, they're not fans. You can't, you can't t- put your thoughts into their thinking. It, it's not the same. You know, I think they want it done soon, but they're going to take their time because keep in mind when Snyder bought the team, there was a feeling after the fact, and certainly years later, where maybe they should have done a better job vetting that situation, but they were kind of, you know, pushing it a little bit. And maybe you would have come up with some different thoughts as to how that group should look or whatever, or maybe it would have gone to, maybe it wouldn't have, but you don't want to rush this situation and put yourself in a spot where maybe the group isn't as strong as you think it is. I do think, excuse me, I do think this is a good group. I've heard good things about them all along. Um, my the dealings I've had with them have been very professional. It's not like it hasn't been with other people involved in this. So that's not, you know, necessarily germane to them, but they're also their experience operating pro sports teams, the 76ers, the New Jersey Devils. I think that gives them a big plus for this situation. Because one of the things that when Snyder came in, that when you heck, I was there, I know what it was like. And then talking to people over the last week or two about what a new owner should prioritize and you know, what you don't want is to act like a fan, because a lot of times when people come in who are in the sports, uh, the business world and come over here, they think that it's easily that it transfers pretty easily. That one, you know, being a business expert translates to being a sports owner. No, it doesn't. So you have to understand how to put together an organization for that particular sport. What does it entail? You have to listen to people. You have to talk to a lot of people. You have to surround yourself with really good people. One of the things that and I talked to Joe Gibbs about this a couple of years ago on the podcast. How does how was he a Hall of Fame coach and then a Hall of Fame race car owner? And the whole reason comes down to who he surrounded himself with. He surrounded himself with really good coaches. And what would he always do? He would give them the credit. You know, those guys make me look smart. This guy makes me look smart. <clears throat> that's part of what his that's part of what made him such a great coach. And it's what makes him a great owner. He has people in that in that race car team who have worked with him for him for a long, long time. That's what you want, but it's knowing how to, how to get the right people. Because one of the things, one of the failings for Snyder, as you think, you know, when you're talking to people here, or even, you know, people who work for him now and who like him, you know, they, they'll say the biggest mistake he made was surrounding himself with people who shouldn't, that he shouldn't have trusted. But I will say the guy making those decisions, was he's putting in people in place like it so he didn't understand that but he's also of that same mindset that those guys had too so it's not like he was some great guy being taken advantage of it was somebody who was operating a certain way and surrounding himself with similar people and or similar minded people and you can't do that and i think you know i'm a i'm a big believer in like listening to leadership and things like that and warren buffett was talking about something the other day and you know, if you like Warren Buffett, but the guy's a success and he's, and, and he's had a long-term marriage too. So one of the things he said, and I fully subscribe to this, is you surround yourself with people who are better than you. 
And, you know, that could be your spouse, that could be your friends. So it raises the bar for yourself. It raises the expectations of who you want to be because you want to be like them. I think for an organization, that's what you need here. It's not what they've had. And you can't have people like Bruce Allen come in here who make people feel miserable because he doesn't want to open up the purse strings. That's what happened here too, folks. And it took it's taken a while for the pay for scouts, for lower level workers to come up to speed. But it was so low and it was because of Bruce Allen controlled the purse strings. Dan signed off on it. But you, when you, you know, if you, if they want to blame Bruce Allen, who hired him? You got to hire good people. And it starts with that. And I think one of the things that I've heard with Harris is he does that he does basically go after really good people. And we'll go, he went after Daryl Morey, a GM, who's one of the best GMs in the NBA, went after him a couple of times because he, because he felt he was that good and he wanted to get him. He's hired good people. They built a good organization and the New Jersey devils, they had some up and down years in his ownership this year. They're really good. So I don't know as much about his ownership there. I know more about the Sixers because I'm more of an NBA fan. But I do think like, you know, and, and as we've seen here, sometimes it, you just got to get the right people. But I do think it starts with surrounding yourself with the right people. Gibbs did it. And he always, that's why he was a success. Jack Ken Cook did it. It's why he was a success. Dan Snyder did not do it enough. And that's why this ownership failed in the end. That was a big reason. Did you know the largest ropes course in Zipline Park in the country is right here in the DMV? Located in the heart of Montgomery County, the Adventure Park at Sandy Spring combines climbing and zip lining to create an aerial obstacle course unlike any other. With challenges anywhere from 10 to 75 feet in the air, there is something for all skill levels. Looking for some family time or the perfect date night before football season starts? You can even climb and zip line under the stars. Would you rather keep your feet on the ground? Give axe throwing a try. With their projector systems, you can throw at traditional targets, play tic-tac-toe, connect four, or even hunt zombies. Listeners of this show can get $5 off any ticket by entering the code KIME23DC at checkout. That's KIME, K-E-I-M, 23DC. So there you have it, folks. Climbing, zip lining, axes, food, and bonfires right in your backyard. The weather is warming up, so it's the perfect time to head outside and join the adventure at www.theadventurepark.com. That's www.theadventurepark.com and enter promo code KIME23DC. I do think that the people here are very excited about what comes next. I think they, they I know the people here have heard good things about the Harris Group, and I know they feel like they're going to get a fair shake for being evaluated, and that's at multiple levels. So that's, you know, I think they have excitement about all this, and, and they should, because there's a lot to look forward to, as Jason Wright always says, on the other side. And no matter what they thought about Snyder, it's been a really, really, really hard road the last few years. This gives them a chance to now start fresh to feel good about working for this organization. That hasn't been the case in a while. You know, I was talking to someone the other day who said he feels bad for some people coming out of college and this is their first job and they're excited to work in the NFL. And they tell people where they work for, who they work for and the reaction is negative. That stuff has to go away. And it goes away once you get some new group in and then once you start to establish yourself and then once you start to win games, that stuff starts to fade away. Now, how many fans come back? I don't know. You guys are the fans. You may know, you're going to know that better than I will. But I do think it starts with treating people in your organization, right? Building a winning culture. And then it spreads out to the fans because if you treat your people right, you're going to treat customers right. And again, that, as you know, has not happened over the last couple of decades. So that's, that's some of it. Um, it's been an exhausting process to, as a reporter for this. There are times where I wasn't reporting things. Why? Because I wasn't trusting all the information that you were getting. I was hearing a lot of stuff. A lot of people were. It doesn't mean you have to report everything you hear because that's how I think mistakes were made throughout this process. I'm not going to single anybody out because that's not I'm not I'm not God, I'm not the reporter god here because we all make mistakes, but I do think it's been an exhausting process and I'm glad we're nearing the end of that particular aspect of it. It leads to a lot of anxiety if you're a reporter. Um 
You know, I just, that's, that's the honest truth. You, you can't relax. You, you, your stomach is in knots. Most of the time you're dealing with this, you see something on a Saturday in mid-March and you think, oh no, is this really at this point? You end up making a lot of calls just to find out, no, they're not at this point. And so like, there's a lot of that that goes on and that's just part of the job, but it's been an exhausting one, especially after the last couple of years. So I think we're all looking forward to moving on from this situation and looking ahead to what comes next. Again, there's still, there's still more, there's still more to go. It's not over. Then I know when two of the biggest questions we're going to get after this, the rebrand is that would there be a rebrand and will they play it out? Will they go back to RFK? I can tell you on the rebrand, multiple people here with the current team say there's, they don't think there's any way that it happens. They just fly out and say no, because they know the cost involved was at least 15 million to change it. Now, if you're a billionaire and you say, oh, hey, it's 15 million, but you know, these guys don't just give away money for any reason. I know from a fan perspective, you know, from an NFL perspective, I think there would say like, at what point do you stop changing the name? You need to settle on one and keep it from a fan. You know, what happens if you don't like the next one a t- guy would name? Well, from a fan perspective, I know some of the thought is, but it moves you past the Snyder era. And it starts, if you really want to start fresh, you could do it like that. Now I will like the NFL rule is, if you rebrand, you have to wait five years before you can do it again. Typically, they're talking about colors, uniforms, et cetera. That's why I say rebrand. It, they don't. They didn't include team name because it hadn't been an issue. So, but it was considered a rebrand. So, in a rebrand situation, it's five years. Just understand that. So, I don't think that they can come. They, nobody's going to come right in and do that. Would they export? I don't know. I don't know enough about what the Harris Group thinks about the name or a possibility would they explore something i don't know i do think that rfk is where they would want to go i think that's where anybody would want to go i do know there are hurdles that remain there and so we're gonna we're gonna i'm gonna explore that more but i do know that hurdles and in talking to people multiple people who have been involved in the stadium process with the team local politicians all say the same thing they think that they think it will be hard to go rfk not impossible and i do think that the Harris group will certainly try to get that accomplished. So, you know, I, I think but w- whether or not they'll be successful, I don't know, but as some, someone else told me, you have to try, you have, you owe it to the fans to try. If they went down there, they would then build a practice facility, probably in Loudoun County near where they're at out in Ashburn. So, or maybe, I don't know if it'd be in Ashburn, but it'd be somewhere near there. Um, but they would get out of the current facility, build another one, build up around there, and if they played at RFK, and again, I would not, I don't know what the odds I'd put on that. I think, like I said, there are some definite hurdles, and I've talked about that on other podcasts, but it's not impossible because, listen, a year ago, what if we had said, Dan Snyder's going to sell? What would I say? Well, it's eh, probably not. Look where we are today, folks. So I'm not going to dismiss anything, but I will say it will take a lot to get it done there. We'll see. So stay tuned. That's what I know. I don't know what's, I don't know when the next step, I don't know when it'll be finalized. I don't know when it will be sent to the league for approval, but I think we're at a really good point folks for you. And I'm happy for you if, because I know this is what a lot of people have wanted for a long time. So there you go. That's it for me. I will be back on Sunday night, Sunday, I think Sunday night with my gang, assuming nothing else happens with the ownership situation. I'll be back with Sam Fortier. Matthew Paris and Pete Haley. And we'll have a on-field football discussion. I'm also going to start bringing on some people who are very familiar with the Harris ownership group and set up and how they are, et cetera, to give you some more insight into who Washington will be getting as an owner. We know he's local. We know Mitchell Rails is local, um, but who are they as owners? So I know some people who know them pretty well. So I'll start bringing them on as of early next week. And then we have the draft in a few weeks. So, We'll get to that too, but that's what I'm going to do too with my boys on Sunday, assuming nothing else happens. So I'll talk to you next time.